All right, folks, today we're going to do chapter two of Number the Stars, and it's called, Who is the Man Who Rides Past? Tell me a story, Anne-Marie, Kirstie begged as she smuggled, snuggled into, her, into the bed with her big sister. Tell me a fairy tale. Anne-Marie sighed and wrapped her arms around her little sister. All Danish children grew up loving fairy tales. The most famous fairy tale writer of all, Hans Christian Andersen, had been from Denmark himself. You want the one about the Little Mermaid? That had always been Anne Marie's favorite. But Kirsty said, no. Tell me one that starts with a king and a queen and they have a beautiful daughter. All right. Once upon a time there was a king. And a queen. Don't forget the queen. And a queen. And they lived in a wonderful, beautiful castle. Was the castle called... Alamenborg? Kirsty asked. Shh, don't keep interrupting or I'll never finish the story. No, it wasn't Alamenborg. It was a pretend palace. Anne-Marie talked on and on, making up a story about a king and a queen and their beautiful daughter, Princess Kirsten. And she told things about balls and fancy gowns and feasts of pink frosted cupcakes until Kirsty's deep, even breathing told her that her little sister was finally asleep. Anne-Marie stopped. She waited for a second. She half expected Kirsty to say, Then what happened? But Kirsty was still. And Anne-Marie started thinking about the real king, King Christian X, and his real palace where he lived in the center of Copenhagen. Oh, the people of Denmark loved King Christian. He was not like a fairy tale king who stood on a balcony waving at people or tried to find husbands for his wife, for his daughters. Now, he was a real human being, a man with a kind, serious face. She had seen him a lot when she was younger. Every morning, he would go riding through the streets of Copenhagen on his horse, Jubilee. One time, when she was a little girl, her big sister, Lise, had taken her there to see the king. And they'd stood there and waved at him as he went by, and he'd wave back at them. And when he went by, Lise told Anne-Marie, Now you're special forever because a king has waved to you. Anne-Marie turned her head on the pillow and looked out the windows at the, at the dark September night. Thinking about Lise, her older, beautiful, serious sister, always made her feel sad. So right now I'm wondering to myself, she seems like she loves her sister, Lise, so why does thinking about her make her feel sad? Let me keep reading. So instead of thinking about Lise, she started thinking about the king, who was still alive when Lise was not. So now I know why she's sad, because Lise is dead. Anne-Marie remembered a story that Papa had told her just right after the war started, just after Denmark had surrendered and the Nazi soldiers had come in. One evening, Papa said that he had been walking home from the office, waiting to cross the street, when King Christian went riding by on his horse. One of the German soldiers had turned and asked a teenage boy, Who is that man who rides past here every morning on his horse? Papa had smiled to himself, thinking how silly it was that anyone in Denmark didn't know who the king was. The boy had answered, He's our king. He's the king of Denmark. There is his bodyguard, the soldier had asked. And do you know what that boy said? Papa said to Anne-Marie. She was sitting on his lap. She was little then, only about seven years old. She shook her head and waited for him to answer. That boy looked straight at the soldier and said, All of Denmark is his bodyguard. Anne-Marie had shivered. It sounded so brave. Is it true, Papa, what the boy said? Papa thought for a moment. He always thought about Anne-Marie's questions before he answered them. And then he said, Yes, it's true. Anyone in Denmark would die to protect King Christian. You too, Papa? Yes. And Mama? Mama, too. Anne-Marie shivered. Then I would, too, Papa, if I had to. They were quiet for a minute. Across the room from them, Mama looked up and smiled. Anne-Marie and Papa smiled, too. Mama was crocheting that evening, a lacy edge on a pillowcase, to be part of Lisa's trousseau. Her fingers moved rapidly, turning the thin white thread into an intricate, narrow border. Lise was a grown-up girl of 18 years old and she was about to get married to Peter Nelson. When Lise and Peter married, Mama had said, Anne Marie and Kirsty would have a brother for the very first time. Papa, 
Anne-Marie asked. Sometimes I wonder why the king wasn't able to protect us. Why didn't he fight the Nazis so they wouldn't come into Denmark with their guns? Papa sighed. We're such a tiny country, and they had such an enormous army. Our king was wise. We don't have many soldiers, and he knew that if we fought, many, many Danish people would have been killed. They fought in Norway, Anne-Marie said. Papa nodded. Yes, they fought very brave in Norway. They have those huge mountains for the soldiers to hide in, but they were still crushed by the Nazis. In her mind, Anne-Marie pictured a map that she'd seen at school that had Denmark and Sweden and Finland and Norway, and she imagined a big fist crushing down on Norway. And there's soldiers in Norway too now, right? Yes, Papa said. And in Holland, Mama said. And in Belgium and France. But not in Sweden, Anne-Marie said. She was proud of herself that she remembered so much about the world. On the map at school, Sweden was blue. And she'd seen Sweden, too, even though she'd never been there. She could go to her Uncle Henrik's house, where he lived north of Copenhagen, close to the sea, and she could stand on the shore and look across and see this really small strip of land. And Mama and Papa had told her, that is Sweden. That's true, Papa said. Sweden is still free. And now, three years later, it was still true. But a lot of other things had changed. King Christian was getting older, and he'd gotten hurt very badly last year when he fell from his horse, Jubilee, who had carried him around the streets of Copenhagen so many mornings. For days, they thought he would die, and all of Denmark had mourned for him. But he hadn't died. He got better. It was Lise who was not. It was her tall, beautiful sister who had had an accident just two weeks before her wedding. There was a carved blue trunk in the corner of the bedroom. Lise could kind of, Anne-Marie could kind of see its shape in the dark. And in it were folded all of Lise's pillowcases, her wedding dress that she'd never gotten to wear, and the yellow dress that she danced in the night that she and Peter got engaged. Mama and Papa never talked about Lise. They never opened the trunk either, but Anne-Marie did sometimes when she was by herself in the apartment. She would open it and she would touch Lise's beautiful things and remember her gentle, quiet, soft-spoken sister who was looking forward to getting married and having a family. Peter, Lisa's fiancé, had not married anybody after Lisa died, but he had changed a lot. Once he'd been like this fun-loving big brother who would always tickle Anne-Marie and Kirsty and tease them and make them laugh, but now he still came by the apartment very often, but he was always in a hurry and talked quickly to Mama and Papa about things that Anne-Marie didn't understand. He didn't sing the silly nonsense songs anymore that would make Anne-Marie and Kirsty laugh and, and, and laugh until they cried. And he didn't stay at the house very long either. Papa had changed too. He seemed much older and tired and defeated. The whole world had changed. The only thing that remained the same were the fairy tales. And they lived happily ever after. Anne-Marie said, whispering in the dark, repeating the and finishing the tale for her sister who slept beside her quietly with one thumb stuck in her mouth. Oh man, we've learned some sad things in this chapter. Not only have the Nazis been in Denmark for a long time, poor Anne-Marie, her older sister, has died. Isn't that terrible? And the king is getting older and he was injured. A lot of sad things in this chapter, but we're learning a lot more about the characters in it. Tomorrow we'll read chapter 3 called, Where is Mrs. Hursk? We haven't met anybody yet named Mrs. Hursk, but we'll find out about her tomorrow.